The Spectrum Ability Accessibility Podcast is brought to you by Spectrum Ability. Spectrum Ability provides accessibility consulting, assessments, and RHFAC certification for the Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley, and British Columbia area. If you would like to become more accessible, contact us at spectrumability.com. Hello and welcome to episode one of the Spectrum Ability Accessibility Podcast. This is Arnold coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia. And in this opening episode, we're going to go easy. We're going to ease into accessibility. We're going to talk about what it is and why it matters and why is it still an issue today in 2019 as of this recording. So accessibility. It's such a very packed topic and it can mean a lot of things. It can mean physical accessibility. It can mean technological accessibility. So for example, physical accessibility is like how you get into a building, kind of like uh, ramps and elevators and all that. And technological accessibility has to do with like, how do you access a website if you are blind or visually impaired or low vision? How do you have access to videos if you're deaf? Like how do you understand the video and all that stuff? So we're going to focus a lot on the physical accessibility part because that's what Spectrum Mobility does for the most part. But also it's easiest for people to understand because I find that if you start getting into the more complex uh, forms of accessibility and you don't have the basics, people don't really seem to understand it. And that's the thing. A lot of people don't understand what accessibility is because they've never had to deal with it. And when you haven't had to deal with it, you tend to not know anything about it. So you are going to talk about what it is. So accessibility um, in my world uh, has to do a lot with universal design in the physical space. So universal design, what exactly is universal design? Well, it's a term coined by a guy named Ronald Mace, and um, he defines universal design as, quote unquote, the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So that's a pretty long sentence, but what does it mean? Let's break it down. The design of products and environments. So obviously, products can mean uh, things like buildings. A building is a product. An environment is also part of the product. And uh, I will get into that in a bit with an example. Uh, So products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible. And it's really not possible to make something 100% accessible because everyone has different needs. And this is true for the able-bodied population as well. So in the able-bodied population, people without disabilities might be a lot taller than other people. They might be shorter. They might be uh, skinnier. They might be, um, they might have better eyesight. They might be more athletic. When you think about the general population, there's a huge range. And the same is true for people with disabilities. There is a huge range of abilities out there. So it's not just black and white. It's not like somebody can't walk and somebody can walk and there's nothing in between. It's not like somebody can hear and can't hear and there's nothing in between. Or someone can see, can't see, and so on. And really, when it comes to ability, it is always going to be a range. So that is why it says in the definition by Ronald Mace, to the greatest extent possible. And the last part of it, of that quote from Ronald Mace is, without the need for adaptation or specialized design. And that is the toughest one in a way because sometimes you have to adapt something for it to be used. But what they what he means is that um, you don't need to specialize anything in the building or in the space, I should say, uh, in order for it to work. So like it should work to an extent. Like it shouldn't be, uh, for example, microwaves that are way above the counter. Well, if you're short, anyone who's under a certain height is not going to be able to use it unless they have an adaptation. But if you have the microwave further down, that means that most people would be able to reach it, including tall people, including short people. And you don't need to adapt anything to make it work. So that's kind of 
uh, the example I use sometimes to explain that part. So now let's bring about an example. There's a building in downtown Vancouver. It's a condo building and it's brand new, built within the past 10 years, I would say. And the front entrance has a flight of steps and they decide to build what's called a platform lift right next to it. And what a platform lift is, it's a platform that can fold out and you can roll a mobility device like a wheelchair or a scooter onto it. And then you press a button and it'll lift you up the stairs to the top. Now, that is technically accessible, but that is not universal design. So what do I mean by that in this example? So let's go back to the definition. It is a product that's uh, designed to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible. A platform lift looks like it can be used by people to the greatest extent possible. But is it? Because what happens to those things is that you probably need a key to operate it. And if you don't have a key, you can't operate it. It's already restricting people from using it. And when it comes to keys, um, a key can be an issue for people who don't have finger function or people who don't have fingers, such as amputees. So if you need your fingers to manipulate a key to operate it, it's already locking out a lot of people. And you might be thinking, well, when you're in a wheelchair, you have an issue with your legs, not your arms, right? Well, not necessarily uh, just the legs, because a lot of people who are in wheelchairs they might have finger dexterity issues because they might have a spinal cord injury that affects how their fingers work, or they might have had a stroke because um, strokes can often affect your fine motor skills. Or you might be someone who was born with cerebral palsy and that affects your fine motor skills too. So this is where it starts getting a little mucky. So you can start seeing this platform lift being an issue. And then you look at the last part, it says, without the need for adaptation or specialized design. That's what the quote says by Ronald Mace. Well, if you have a flight of stairs that requires a platform lift to get up it, if you're on wheels, that's not really without the need for adaptation or specialized design because you need something specialized to go up the stairs. So that's kind of the, um, the gist of that. So that example of that new building is not universal design. It's just not. That's kind of where we're trying to head towards. Uh, we're trying to head towards universal design because when you think about accessibility just by itself, it doesn't always include universal design. So that's kind of where, um, where our goal is. Why do we have situations where it's like that? Part of the issue is when, whenever I approach a uh, business owner, sometimes they seem to think of accessibility as two things. One is that it is an optional, nice to have luxury item, or it is an add-on, something that's added on top of something ex existing. When it comes to being a luxury item, part of that has to do with like um, some legitimate reasons and also some uh, misconceptions. So the legitimate reason is sometimes it has to do with money. And granted, things do cost a lot sometimes, but sometimes they don't. Um, there is a stat out there saying most uh, adaptations cost about $500 or less, which is not a lot of money. But people don't realize that they think that any adaptation is going to cost into the thousands of dollars, which is not always the case. And if it is the case, there are often grant programs out there that can help with that. You know, it, it is a pressing need and there are groups out there that are trying to improve this. Just got to do some research. And the other aspect of it is an add-on. And this is true for that building I just mentioned, is that when they built it, they didn't think about accessibility when they were designing it. They thought of it afterwards. And that happens a lot, even to newer buildings. They would design the building and then they would uh, think about accessibility afterwards and see, well, how can we uh, force accessibility into the building? Which is actually kind of doubling your workload because if you had designed it from the start to be accessible, you would have saved yourself a lot of time. So as soon as people stop thinking of accessibility as a luxury nice to have, and also as an add-on, things would start changing. 
Um, people also um, ha don't think of accessibility as a human rights issue sometimes because it's not really framed as such sometimes uh, when we're talking about accessibility planning. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, there is a place um, locally here in the Vancouver area. I'm not going to name which one. Um, they are currently in trouble for accessibility reasons and uh, the complaint went through the Human Rights Tribunal of Canada because accessibility is technically a human right issue. Because if you are someone who has a disability and you're prevented from doing what everyone else is able to do through no fault of your own and through either neglect or through um, violations of bylaws or anything like that, then it is a human rights issue because you're effectively discriminating against, um, they're discriminating against who can use your services and who cannot. So accessibility is a human rights issue. It's not a nice uh, luxury item as people tend to think. All right, so we know now a little bit about accessibility, but why is it important? Why, why is it so pressing, so dire that we need to know about it? Well, I'm going to throw some numbers that you might or might not know, um, and it might blow your mind if, uh, if you do not know them. Actually, it might blow your mind even if you do know them. Okay, so about 1 in 5 to 1 in 7 people in the world has a disability. This is the largest minority group in the world. And you might be going like, well, I don't really believe you. In my country, you know, I live in Canada or the USA or some other country, we don't have that many people with disabilities. Well, hold on there, because when I say the word, word disability, it means a lot of things. Um, it means people who might use wheelchairs, people who might use um, crutches, canes, uh, walkers, scooters, people who are blind, deaf, hard of hearing. It includes people who have um, a multitude of these. It can include people with uh, learning disabilities, cognitive issues, and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter which country you look at, that ratio is going to be more or less consistent. Bear in mind that ratio is only applicable to people who identify as having a disability. One group that often doesn't identify as having a disability, seniors. Think about it. Do you have a grandmother or a grandfather who will never admit to having a disability despite having knee problems, hip problems, vision problems, hearing problems, all that stuff. Because if you think they're, um, they're disabled, they're going to yell at you or they're not going to admit it. There is a stigma around disability that prevents them from admitting that they might have a disability. And also the word disability is very uh, multifaceted because it also depends on what time and where you live. So what I mean by time is um, things change. Adaptations are made and things get invented. Medical advancements also come into play. Think about people who wear glasses. If you are living in a day and age and a place where glasses are not normal or not readily available, if you're nearsighted or farsighted, you're going to have a disability because you would not be able to function in the society where you live. However, in this day and age, in a place like Canada, if you have glasses, it might not be a disability. So, you know, there are some places that are still in, not in a situation to have readily available eyewear. So that might be a disability there. Now, think about accessibility. A lot of people will be like, well, big deal, you know, one in five, one in seven. I'm only catering to one in seven people. Forget it, right? Well... Not necessarily, because people who use accessibility features are not always people with disabilities or physical issues. It might be someone with a baby stroller. If you have a baby stroller and you have a flight of stairs and a ramp next to it, guess what? You're going to use a ramp. If you are in a shopping mall with uh, escalators and elevators and you have a bigger baby stroller, you're going to use the elevator. If you are someone who is carrying luggage or carrying cargo, you're probably going to use a ramp and elevator as well. The list goes on because it's not just people with physical issues that would need the accessibility features that are available. 
So there are a lot of reasons. There are many, many, many reasons why accessibility is important. And when you factor those situations in, suddenly you're not catering to one in five anymore. You're not catering to one in seven. You're catering to a lot more than that. And once people wrap their heads around the demand of accessibility, it starts to become not only something that will keep you out of a human rights tribunal, but it also becomes something that is a lot more important than previously realized. So this is something that I try to get across in my line of work, but also it's something that I hope more people will start thinking about because once you start thinking about something, you're going to start solving problems. There's a quote that I use for many of my clients. That quote is, the first step towards solving a problem is giving a damn. Because if you start to care about something, it doesn't really matter whether you know how to do it correctly or not. The fact that you care means that you're going to start subconsciously improving stuff. Because if you don't care, then nothing will ever get improved. The first step towards solving a problem is giving a damn. So that is episode one of the Spectrum Mobility Accessibility Podcast. I hope that was a, an adequate introduction to accessibility and why it's important. We will talk about why it's important over and over again, because there are so many situations where you would think that it would already be an issue of the past. We probably would have solved it by now. But the answer is often no, we haven't solved it. And you might be shocked in more ways than one at why. So in the next episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about what accessibility entails and some common misconceptions about accessibility and also a couple more things to blow your mind. So until next time, this is Arnold from Vancouver. This has been the Spectrum Mobility Accessibility Podcast. Stay accessible. The Spectrum Mobility Accessibility Podcast is brought to you by Spectrum Mobility. Spectrum Mobility provides accessibility consulting, assessments, and RHFAC certification for the Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley, and British Columbia area. If you would like to become more accessible, contact us at spectrummobility.com.